those instruments. They really sang well. Well, our speaker this morning, continuing in our study in the book of Acts, is Ed. And I think Ed's going to be covering a very, very familiar portion of Acts 16 this morning. So, Ed, come. And hopefully that last song will be a clue and a very important part of this message. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 16, uh, we will be covering uh, verses 16 through 40. And while you're getting there, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word as it has been settled in heaven, Lord. As it is said to us, you must be born again. Father, we thank you for uh, this commandment, uh, Father, that uh, we have followed in order to become your children, in order to be saved. Father, it's not by human works that we have done, but according to your mercy that you've saved us uh, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit that you shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's through what he did for us on Calvary's cross. It's for... uh, shedding his precious blood and dying for us. And Father, three days later, he proved that his sacrifice was acceptable to you in the fact that he was risen from the dead. He is risen, he is risen, he is truly risen indeed. Father, bless this word as it goes out, Lord, that in all in all you may receive the honor and the glory as you properly deserve. And we'll be careful to praise you and thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Verse 16 starts out of Acts chapter 16. As we were on our way to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by the spirit of divination, claiming to foretell future events and able to discover hidden knowledge, which she brought her owners much gain by her fortune telling. Now it's important to note the word we, Paul, is included here. And I in my studies, I remember a little poem that Milt Salomon had taught us. If in the book you choose to look, five things observe with care, of whom it speaks, to whom it speaks, and why and when and where. So here we're talking about we, which would include Luke, the physician. As we went, and the word here indicates a walk or a journey of some length, When we go to prayer, we usually go to our bedroom or we can be sitting on a couch, but these men and women traveled some distance in order for corporate prayer. So that must have been important uh, in their life. And a certain damsel, it's a young woman, and this word would commonly be applied to servants and perhaps uh, denoting a slave here. And she was possessed with the spirit of divination or the spirit of Python. In Greek mythology, Apollo, not Paul's friend, but the, uh, the god Apollo, descended from Olympus in order to select a site for his shrine and his oracle. He chose a spot on the southern side of Mount Parnassus and found it guarded by Python, an enormous and terrifying serpent. Apollo slew it with an arrow and let its body rot in the sun. Hence the name of this of the serpent, Python, means rotting. The name Python was subsequently then used to denote a prophetic demon and was also used of soothsayers who practiced speaking from the belly. Now this word occurs in the Septuagint, and it's rendered as having a familiar spirit, possibly including the witch of Endor, in 1 Samuel 28, 7 and 8. Three of the times it's used, Luke, uh, Leviticus 19:31, and the souls that turn after such have some familiar spirits and after wiz- wizards to go a whoring after them. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. So God is not pleased with these uh, persons with familiar spirits. 
Leviticus 20 uh, verse 6 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In Leviticus 20, 27, A man also or a woman who hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Note, this is not saying that ventriloquists <clears throat> that throw their verse and converse with a vent figure are of the devil. The ventriloquists are merely entertainers to amuse us. Now, the content of their act may not always be wholesome, but that's a different subject. In verse 17, this woman, this girl, she kept following Paul and the rest of us, shouting loudly, These men are the servants of the Most High God. They announce to you the way of salvation. Verse 18, And she did this for many days. Again, this girl as some suppose, was not merely a ventriloquist or an imposter. She was not a sleep talker or a lunatic. This girl was demon-possessed. The demon was within her, knew of Paul, and continuously announced who he was and what he was doing. Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, has made known to you the way of salvation. Now, we are seeing a resurgence of demonism even in our day. Do not get tied up with spiritism by fooling around with it. It is dangerous. Demonism is a reality. As a matter of fact, I was involved with this before I was saved. At the end of my sophomore year, I'm going to go into my testimony, which probably most of you have never heard before. At the end of my sophomore year in college, there was a freshman girl that said to me that she, her mother died when she was three years old, and she wanted to contact her mother to ask questions of her mother. I saw nothing wrong with it. I started writing, studying on what to do, what to say, what to wear during a, a seance, and pretty soon I, I had ten pages of, of how to accomplish this. As a matter of fact, you talk about getting into the devil's work. There were friends of friends of friends that were stopping by my house that I didn't even know about, handing me books and literature on how to accomplish this. At one point, I even owned the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. A friend of Jerry's and mine at work, an older man named Tony, found out what I was doing, and he went home one day, took him a half an hour to get there, half an hour to get back, and he brought me a book called Hell by Oliver B. Green. I don't know if you've ever read anything by Oliver B. Green, but he sort of highlights things, whether it be highlighted in large black letters that jump off the page or, or highlighted in large red letters which jump off the page. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that was the beginning of me realizing that what I was getting into was not of God. That year, I took my pages back to college because I figured that I had a nice term paper written already. Someday I could write something and turn it into a term paper. Well, I found out for the next two years I didn't have anything that would use anything like that. And a young fella came down about a week later and said, do you have any term papers? I said, I got this one. He said, well, let me take a look at it. So I gave him all my books, and I gave him my papers. And about a week later, I went down to his dorm and took my books back. And a week later, with the papers in his room, his room burned down. They never found out what caused the fire. I know what caused the fire. God didn't want those papers around because of the demonism that was written there. Well, <clears throat> again, that got my attention uh, from God. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And at that point, my grades were suffering. I took a year off to get my head together. And I just happened to work with a bunch of Christians that had a bounce in their step. They knew the Bible, and they could say, Thus saith the Lord, and prove it from the Bible. Well, I started going to Mount Washington Baptist Church there, 
And uh, at one point, we were, after the service, we were sitting out front on the steps, and I was arguing with the Apostle Paul and the uh, Apostle Peter about you have to work your way to heaven. Well, both of those guys, again, bouncing a step, knew the Lord, knew the Bible, showed me beyond a shadow of a doubt that salvation was a free gift. Well, I was not ready to give up yet. I was, quote, having too much fun with my lifestyle. Christmas that year, it was right around Christmas that I started going, was on a Thursday. And I said to one of the fellas, well, what time's the Christmas service? We don't have service on Christmas. I said, you have to. It's a holy day of obligation. So, well, that's not found in the New Testament. Besides that, it's a day that we spend with our families and, and um, show each other there that we love them. Well, since, since going to church was not a, a requirement in the New Testament, I decided to take the next week off. Did not go to church. Well, lo and behold, my Sunday school teacher, Milt, called my house while I was out playing football that morning. And uh, I figured, what, what does he want with me? You know, who am I? And, uh, and I called him back, and, and I said, hey, can I do anything for you? And he said, no, what can we do for you? We missed you this morning. And it's like, whoa, I'm important to somebody, and I'm, I'm only Ed. Well, the next week after that was uh, New, Year's, New Year's Eve. And I had a chance to go to an all-night bowling party with the Christians or an all-night beer party with my friends. Well, guess which one I chose to go to. The next Sunday when I met my friends at church, I said, hey, how'd the uh, bowling go? And they said, we had fun. It's like, well, how can you have fun without drinking? And the, and the uh, brother said, because we have Jesus. And it's like, I could still hear my head spinning around in circles with that answer, because we have Jesus. Well, <clears throat> the next week, my old-natured friends decided that we were going to go up to Seven Springs and ski, and we smoked marijuana on the way up. I did inhale, and we drank while we were up there. And coming home, we were crossing the cloverleaf on 51. We were heading north on 51 and my buddy was playing with my knob on my glove compartment and as I was staring at that focused in a stupor out of the corner of my eye I see a man in a black trench coat walking in the fast lane which I was in on 51 and I swerved to miss him and I missed him by inches and I felt the guilt of what would have happened if I killed that man I knew I shouldn't have been drinking as much as I was. I knew I shouldn't have been smoking dope. And here I was, laid before God, completely bare and naked. Well, <clears throat> in my old nature, I said, yep, I should get saved. But you know what? I'm having the time of my life. So for the next week, I drank everything I could get a hold of. I smoked everything I could get a hold of. And I came home January 15, 1975, and I laid in bed and I said, God, I give up. I want Jesus as my Savior. So stay away from demonism. Stay away from your Ouija board, your tarot cards. Stay away from your, um, uh, what's it called, uh, the horoscope in the, in the paper. Don't have anything to do with that. That's demonism. Now, this slave girl seems to have appointed herself to be the apostles' Herod, herald, announcing to them wherever, announcing them wherever they went. Now, Paul did not want her to continue to do that. Her presence in public relation implied that the missionaries were allies with the demon that the people knew and dwelt her. And in verse 18, part B, Then Paul, being sorely annoyed and worn out, turned and said to the spirit within him, within her, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very moment. Possibly Paul waited many days in order to do this so that he could fast and pray. And note that he said it to the spirit within her. He did not charge the girl 
at all. Verse 19, but when her owners discovered that their hope of profit was gone, note their gravy train was in the graveyard. They caught hold of Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities in the, in the marketplace where trials are held. Her master's profits had dried up. They evaporated. And you know, if you touch a man's pocketbook, he will begin to move swiftly and decisively. And when her owners saw that their lucrative little business of fortune telling was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas and dragged them violently into the marketplace for a fair trial. And when they brought them before the magistrates, they declared, these fellows are Jews and they are throwing our city into great confusion. Now it was contrary to strict Roman law for a Jew to propagate their religion among the Romans. They, they were allowed to make proselytes of all other nations in the empire. And remember, the Jews at this time were in special disgrace, having been recently banished from Rome by Claudius Caesar. And note also that the Philippians did not appear to have recognized the distinction between Christians and Jews at this time. Verse 21, they encouraged the practice of, cust of customs. This is the group of men ac uh, still accusing Paul and Silas. They encouraged the practice of customs, which it is unlawful for us Romans to accept or observe. Remember here that Philippi was a Roman colony and that they practiced Roman idolatry. Paul and his men were charged with trying to change things. And of course, the real issue was that the girl's master had lost their source of income. Verse 22, the crowd also joined in the attack upon them and the magistrates, the rulers, tore their clothes off them and commanded that they be beaten with rods. And, we, and when they had struck them with many blows, again, remember, the Jews did not have the 39-stripe rule that the Jews had. In 2 Corinthians 11.23, Paul states that he received stripes beyond measure. There was, it was too much to count. It was not 39 that they counted out meticulously so that they did not go over the forty. After this, they had beaten them. They threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Isn't that ironic? After they pummeled them, they were, the jailer was told, keep them safe. Make sure that nothing bad happens to them. In verse 24, the jailer, having received so strict a charge, put them in the inner prison the the uh, the bottom dungeon and fastened their feet in stocks. These men were beaten, pounded, their backs were lacerated. They are bloody and they were locked into the stocks, which is an instrument of torture. Now, what would you have done in these circumstances? What would I have done? And did Paul have an example to follow? In Acts chapter 5, 40 and 41, we have Peter's example. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak of the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Counted worthy that they were able to take this punishment because of the name of Jesus Christ. So Paul had a great example in the apostle Peter. Verse 25, but about midnight, as Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the other prisoners were listening in, that night, 
the prisoners and the, and the guards undoubtedly heard much about Christ and his saving gospel. Through the prayers and the songs of Paul and Silas, as well as through their testimony of rejoicing in the midst of suffering. Are there other examples of hymns in the New Testament? 1 Timothy 3.16 is a hymn. It says, He was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. You can imagine that being put to song. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16, who was the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone hath immortality, dwelling in the light unapproachable, who no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honor and, and power eternal. Amen. Another hymn. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. This is a trustworthy saying. If we have died together with him, we shall also reign together with him. If we deny him, then he himself will deny us. If we are faithful to him, he himself will also deny us. If we are unfaithful to him, he himself will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And one last one, Roman or Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord God Almighty. Righteous and true are thy ways, thou King of the ages. Who shall not fear, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou alone art holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before thee, for for thy righteous acts have been revealed. These are examples of the New Testament hymns that possibly Paul sang even that night. Verse 26, Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken, and all at once all the doors were opened, and everyone's shackles were unfastened. When the jailer started out of his sleep, saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. Rome held the jailer responsible for all of the prisoners. If any escaped, he took on the punishment of those that escaped. If the prisoner was worthy of death, the jailer forfeited his life and was executed himself. So he stands there poised, ready to fall on his own sword. You know, when a man's in that position, he thinks about eternity. He looked into eternity, and he knew he was a lost man. But Paul shouted, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Then the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling and terrified, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Do you see the picture here? Paul and Silas prayed and sang in utter darkness. Could we do that? Verse 30, And he brought them out of the inner prison and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? Only once in the New Testament is this question asked categorically, What must I do to be saved? And they answered, Everyone joined in and said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And this applies both to you and to your household as well. Vladimir Lenin stated, A lie told often enough becomes the truth. In regards to salvation, the world says, You gotta to be saved. Fill in the blank. You've got to be good enough to get to heaven. You've got to have your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds when you slip the surly bonds of earth and die. You've got to follow the church's commandments and edicts. 
you got to fully obey righteous ordinances and decrees or you won't make it. A lie told often enough becomes the, becomes the truth except for those who know the truth. And what does God's holy word say? First of all, the bad news. James 2.10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. If you're keeping the Ten Commandments and you break one of them, God says you're just as bad as someone who has broken them all. Let me state that again. If you tell one itsy bitsy teeny weeny little white lie, you're just as bad as a serial killer in God's sight. If you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. Isaiah 64, 6 says, For we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. If you're taking all your good works to show God how good you've been here on earth, I got news for you. They're filthy rags. And what do you do with filthy rags? You throw them in the fire and burn them. Romans 4, 2 through 8 states, this is the good news. If Abraham was justified by works, he hath whereof the glory or to boast, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. God's perfect righteousness was credited into Abraham's spiritual bank account when he believed what God said. Verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace. The reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you work, you, you, you expect to get paid for it. So if you're working for your salvation, then that's what you're working for. Verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just as Abraham was. You believe God is credited into your spiritual bank account, Christ's perfect righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes, God assigns righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Can you imagine the peace, knowing your iniquities are forgiven and your sins are covered? But wait, there's more. God does even more. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have partnership with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John chapter 1, starting at verse 10. He was in the world. Jesus was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John chapter 3, starting at verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water, the word of God, and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Eternal life is not that difficult to understand. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Galatians 2, 20 and 21. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate, I do not make void the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you, can, if you can work your way to heaven, Jesus did not have to empty the divine treasury when he shed his precious blood and died on Calvary's cross. And Paul wrote in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart... Man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Man does not believe unto his own righteousness. Remember, my righteousnesses are nothing but filthy rags that go in the trash dump and get burnt. But through faith we are given the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, God's Son. In Romans 10.13, and whosoever, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. God gives us a gift. And when we receive that gift by faith, that gift becomes ours. It's transferred into our account. And you can't give it back. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith, but without believing God's word, it is impossible to please him. It's impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder who diligently seek him. And that word diligent means accurately. You need to accurately seek him. By faith, by believing, by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God gives you, puts into your bank account, perfect righteousness, which will stand time and eternity. These are not verses taken out of context. This is doctrine, rightly dividing the word of God. These verses show us what God did and what he wants us to do so that he can redeem us, that is, buy us back out of the marketplace so that we can have fellowship with God after we believe. John Newton stated, I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. Franz Werfel said, To those who believe, no explanation is necessary. To those who do not believe, no explanation is possible. The American Demographics Magazine wrote that the mantra of the new millennium shouts, I am into, re I am into spirituality, not religion. The slogan means that people are searching for spiritual experiences, but they don't want religious dogma or doctrine. They believe that all religions will take people to the same place if they practice spirituality within themselves. And some so-called Christians even spew out the same nonsense. How do some churchgoers 
get sucked into cultural trends that are so contrary to the word of God. They do not fully understand that Christianity is not another route to some spiritual experience. It is the claim to the truth of God. Christianity is a worldview that can be tested to determine how well it answers the fundamental questions that every worldview must address. These questions can be broken down into the categories of creation, man's fall, and God's redemption. Creation refers to ultimate origins. Where did man come from? The fall asks, what's wrong with the world? Where did evil and suffering come from? And redemption asks, how can these problems and consequences be fixed? Can we create a better world? By using these three categories, we can show that among all the religions of the world, Christianity gives the best answer to the current worldview. For example, let's examine the New Age movement with its repackaged Eastern mysticism. On the question of ultimate origins, New Age thought merely believes in a universal spirit, a core of energy underlying all things. It does not hold to a personal God who created us, nor a loving God who works all things together for our good. How well does the New Age movement answer the question of origins? It fails miserably. A basic principle of logic states that an effect cannot be greater than its cause. Yet New Age thought implies that personal beings, like you and me, were created by an impersonal energy force. And what about the fall of man? New Age teaches that suffering and evil did not result from the sin of Adam and Eve. It's merely an illusion from our failure to recognize that we are all part of God. We are all part of the divine consciousness. We think that we are separate individuals and not connected by the divine life force, so that from that arises all forms of selfishness, greed, anger, and resentment. But does anyone really believe that suffering and evil are, are a root resulting from massive illusions? <laughs> Ask someone who's just been mugged if that was an illusion. Finally, the New Age offers no real redemption, only so-called enlightenment. Using meditative techniques, we are urged to recover or rediscover a mystical knowledge of the divine within. But can anybody in insist with a straight face that we are divine, that we are God? In a scene in Shirley MacLaine's television uh, miniseries, Out on the Limb, she is coached by her New Age counselor to shout over and over again, I am God, until she can say it with confidence. It's not easy to convince herself against all the evidence of our sins and our failures that we are actually infinite or divine. When was the last time someone like Shirley MacLaine raised the dead after four days that they were in the ground? No, the answer the answers offered by the New Age thought simply do not stack up with reality. Christianity alone, alone offers an account of our origin and our destination that is realistic and rational. For Christians, Jesus Christ is creator, savior, redeemer, and Lord. And he's the only one to fit all those categories. We must bring this message to the spiritual seekers of our world. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your house. The phrase your house or its equivalent occurs three times in verses 31 to 34. This might tend to minimize the purely personal nature of the divine human encounter if it were not for several factors. Paul uses the singular in exhorting the jailer to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Paul emphasizes the intensely personal nature of faith. You cannot believe for someone else. And we talked about this yesterday. The Jewish tradition assumes that whatever the house 
the head of the, the family did, that would be followed by all the members of the family. And the use of the plain language which indicated the preaching which Paul did was to the jailer as well as to all the members of his household who were all of age, qualifying them for responsible faith as indicated in the following verse. And they declared the word of the Lord, the doctrine concerning the attainment of eternal salvation through Christ in the kingdom of God to him and to all who were in his house. And again, notice the word they. Luke is no longer uh, with them. Wherever he went, they are the ones who spoke these words. The world is watching, Christian, and when they see us shaken by circumstances, as they themselves are, they conclude that there is very little to Christianity. But when they find Christians rising above circumstances and glorifying the Lord, even in our deepest trials, the unsaved then realize that the Christian has something special in knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and bathed them because of their bloody wounds. And he uh, was baptized immediately and all the members of his household. The whole family of the Philippian jailer was saved that night and their actions proved it. Water baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it sure provides a lot of weight to your Christian testimony. Verse 34, and he took them up into his house and set food before them, and he leaped much with joy and exalted with his family as he believed in God. The jailer and his family accepted and joyously welcomed what Paul had made known about Jesus Christ. All in one day, Paul and Silas were flogged, thrown into jail, freed by the direct intervention of God, and now are being royally entertained in the home of these rejoicing young converts. Paul's exhortation in his epistle to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, would have reminded these believers of this situation, how they leaped for joy for their salvation. It is written to one who thinks life is a comedy, to one who feels life as a tragedy, to one who believes life is a victory. And this gives us something to rejoice about every day. Verse 35, but when it was day, the magistrates sent sergeants. They sent policemen saying, release those fellows and let them go. Evidently, the magistrates only intended to teach Paul and Silas a lesson for deserving the peace and not to bring them to trial. These sergeants or lictors, every every time I looked that up, uh, everyone made mention that they carried bundles of rods with axes attached to symbolize their authority. They were the attendants of the chief Roman magistrates. The magistrates realized that what they had done was illegal. Now they are issuing in orders to free the prisoners and get them out of town quickly. And the jailer repeated the words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to release you and let you go. Now, therefore, come out and go in peace. But wait, there's more. But Paul answered them, They have beaten us openly and publicly without a trial and uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison, and they do now thrust us out secretly, no, indeed, let them come here themselves and conduct us out. Cicero tells of a man that was being scourged at Messina, and in the midst of the noise of the rods during the beating, nothing was heard from him but the words, I am a Roman citizen. Cicero went on to say, It is a dreadful thing to bind a Roman citizen. It is a crime to scourge him. It is almost parricide, death to a close relative, to put him to death. One scholar remarked about Paul's statement, almost every word in this reply contains a distinct allegation. It would be difficult to find or frame a sentence superior to it in point of energetic brevity. So the police 
reported this message to the magistrates, and they were frightened when they heard that the prisoners were Roman citizens. You didn't do any harm to a Roman citizen. That's how powerful it was. If you were not a Roman citizen and you claimed to be, you were put to death. So when Paul says that he's a Roman citizen, this sparked the ears of everyone concerned. Verse 39, so they came themselves and striving to appease them by entreaty, apologized to them, and they brought them out and asked them to leave the city. Now Paul's reason for insisting upon a public recognition of their innocence was to protect the new believers whom he would soon be leaving at Philippi. Boy, didn't Paul have a brilliant mind. Verse 40. So Paul and Silas left the prison and went to Lydia's house. And when they had seen the brethren, they warned and urged and consoled and encouraged them, then departed. What must I do to be saved? Four years after the Titanic went down, a young Scotsman rose in a meeting in Hamilton, Canada, and gave the following testimony. I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a spar on that awful night, the tide brought Mr. John Harper of Glasgow also on a piece of wreck near me. He said to me, man, are you saved? And I can just imagine Louis Voyer telling this story. <clears throat> I said, no, I'm not. And he replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The waves bore him away, but strange to say, they brought him back a little nearer, and he said, are you saved now? No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Shortly afterwards, he went down. And there alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. Our unsaved loved ones, our unsaved friends, our unsaved neighbors are crying out, what must I do to be saved? Call them today and tell them. Write them and share God's word of salvation and deliverance. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. Number 283, if we could sing that, please. <clears throat> 